Hello, I am Professor Kino and welcome to my office of Cinematic Antiquity. Today we will be talking about... When it comes to classic slasher characters, you have a handful to pick from. Leatherface, Freddy, Jason, and, of course, Mike Myers. Originally gracing the screen in 1978 with John Carpenter's Halloween, Mike Myers has gripped audiences ever since. His characteristic mask, creepy composure, intense theme music, and general mysteriousness have led him to become one of the most memorable cultural icons in the U.S. However, despite this, Mike Myers has been the subject of nine subpar sequels and remakes. It's safe to say that disappointment, even for the most devout Mike Myers fans, is a word that sums up the Halloween franchise. Understanding this, director David Gordon Green and screenwriters Jeff Fradley and Danny McBride teamed up to create a sequel to the original 1978 film to wipe the slate of disappointment clean and provide a solid foundation that pushes the whole franchise into the future. Premise Forty years after the events of the first Halloween, Laurie Strode is still haunted by the night she was stalked by the terrifying Mike Myers. Having spent the past four decades preparing for the eventuality of Mike Myers escaping the Haddonfield psych ward again, Lori has gone a little off the deep end and consequently has pushed her family away. However, her planning was not for naught because on the day before Halloween, Mike Myers escapes from his confinement during an inmate transfer with the sole intention of finishing what he started all those years before. Writing Halloween 2018 is a bit of a risky film in that it decided to completely retcon all the previous films barring the original, save for its ending. So all the mythos surrounding Mike Myers that has been created over the last 40 years was thrown out of the window. Now instead of having Mike Myers escape at the end of the first film to have him slaughter another day, it is implied that he was soon captured by the authorities and returned to the psych ward where he has been ever since. This whole process removes the mystery about what Mike is overall. In previous incarnations, it was implied that he might have been potentially supernatural, i.e. that he can resurrect himself and is immortal, etc. But this film grounds him more. It makes him just a crazy man and not a crazy thing. Do all these alterations to the mythos do the film any good? I think so, because it allows the film to start fresh with the core ideas presented in the phenomenal original film without needing to feel pressured into adhering to everything that the sequels created, some of which could be seen as nonsensical. But enough about the film's retconning, uh, how was the film itself? For the most part, pretty solid. The film begins in a very interesting way. Two podcast hosts, Aaron and Dana, travel to Haddonfield to do a piece on Mike Myers. They are very interested in him and his story and want to learn more about him and, while they're in the area, Laurie Strode. This segment of the film does a good job of doing two things. Setting up where our two main characters, Laurie and Mike, are now, and playing with the idea of how we as a culture have mythologized Mike Myers. And then from this point, the film sets up all its new characters. A fresh batch of teenagers for Mike to stalk, Laurie's family, i.e. daughter, granddaughter, and son-in-law, a new psychiatrist studying Mike Myers, and a police officer on the lookout for Mike. And while all of these characters are established fairly well, the plethora of them leads to one of the film's biggest flaws. That none of the characters are ever developed all that much, save for Laurie herself, but that is just because she was established 40 years ago with the original film. Most of the characters here are just tropes with some cool ideas interwoven within them that could have been just that much better if they were just developed a little bit more. For example, Lori's daughter takes the trope of the daughter that was pushed away by her mother's intense expectations. What sets her apart from most other characters who follow this trope is that the expectations this time revolved around learning survival skills to face off against Mike Myers. It is a fantastic idea, but we only get glimpses of it, and this is the sort of thing that we see time and time again with all the characters. Don't get me wrong, they were all good the way they are, but they could have been great. And while on the subject of tropes within this film, one other issue with this sequel is that it does fall into some classic slasher cliches here and there. I think that their inclusion was supposed to add fun nods to the genre, but in doing so they subject the film to similar problems that the classic slashers had. For example, when the inmate transport bus crashes and the local police realizes that some of the inmates have disappeared, the main cop notices that while the majority of the inmates were harmless, Mike Myers' name was on the list of those missing. He brings this information to his superior, who does the equivalent of laughing it off and ignoring it. Does he inform the public? Nope. Does he try to cancel Halloween? <laughs> no. Does he send out more police officers to patrol the streets? Nah. Just poor police work across the board. 
Dumb decision making is definitely not gone from this film. It is better than other slasher flicks, but I had hoped that a modern slasher flick would have learned from the problems of its predecessors. Additionally, Mike Myers himself is a little more violent than he was in the original. Instead of stalking his victims and scaring them a little before he kills them, he just butchers people. There is one scene, for example, where he just goes from house to house killing people. While I had nothing wrong with it, some Halloween purists might be a little perturbed by it. Also, there is a little humor interlaced within the film's intensity. I found it entertaining, but I am aware of some people not liking intense movies adding comedy, so if you are one of these people, just keep that in mind. In summary, Halloween 2018 has a good story with intensity, solid characters, and great ideas that is slightly bogged down by its inclusion of some tropes, cliches, and maybe just a few too many characters. Acting. The acting here is solid. With so many characters, it seems like at least one of the actors should have been subpar, but that is not the case. The highlight here, however, is definitely Jamie Lee Curtis, who reprises her role as Laurie Strode. She steps right back into the character and is able to bring all of Laurie's new characteristics as a disturbed victim to life perfectly. It is great to see her back. Additionally, Nick Castle reprises his role as Mike Myers, and he is excellent to see again as well. Judy Greer, as Laurie's daughter Karen, also brings a notable performance as a woman who is trying to move on from a traumatized childhood. And even the group of teenagers played by Andy Matichak, Drew Sheed, Virginia Gardner, Miles Robbins, and Dylan Arnold actually give performances that make them all likable, and each gave me plenty of reasons for me to root for them. And finally, I want to mention Jibreel Nantambu as Julian, the obligatory kid being babysat in a slasher film, for being the best kid being babysat in slasher film history, apart from maybe Jude Lewis's Cole in the aptly named The Babysitter. Costumes, Hair, and Makeup while most of the characters here are average when it comes to what they are wearing, i.e. just basic clothes, they all look great in them. However, no one has a wardrobe that is memorable except, of course, for Mike Myers. The film perfectly ages his mask to make it look like 40 years has passed. No longer is his white creepy face pristine looking, it is now cracked and dirty. It does a great job at separating this film and the original time-wise, and also does a great job at making this Mike Myers slightly unique and memorable, while still retaining the spirit of who he is. Set Design The majority of the film takes place in your basic suburb, and that is fine. If you picture the look of Haddonfield in 1978, you'll have a general idea of what to expect. But there are two additional sets that stood out. The first being the Haddonfield Psychiatric Ward, particularly its courtyard. It is vast and empty, yet still surprisingly claustrophobic, and the floor is detailed in a way that makes it look like a chessboard, which just adds to the whole feeling. It looks great. And the second notable set is Laurie Strode's house. It is filled with so many offshoots, gizmos, and secrets, that when you see it utilized against Mike Myers in the final showdown, it is fascinating to explore and witness in action. Choreography while there are not many fights against Mike Myers in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the intense action scenes of people trying to escape him are top-notch. They are intense, they are brutal, they are engaging, and they are excellent. Cinematography There is some excellent camera work on display here, but what sticks in my mind the most is the beautiful string of tracking shots that follow Mike Myers around Haddonfield while he is on his killing spree. It is equal parts intense and awesome. One part of it sticks right behind Mike as he wanders onto someone's property, gets a weapon, and then kills the owner of the house. And there is another part where the camera remains still on a woman in her house talking on her phone. You see Mike decide to target her, and the way that the camera is placed allows you to see Mike disappear and reappear into view outside the house, then inside the house, right up until he kills his victim. It is really well done. Editing. While the editing was not standout, it was professional. I was never floored by the edits, but what was there was done competently and helped to build the tension when it was needed. CGI. None. Music. John Carpenter and his son Cody chipped in to make the music of this film, and it was worth it. Just hearing the original theme song, as well as modern takes on the original soundtrack, really helped this film capture the spirit of the original. Direction. David Gordon Green was able to take all the elements of the original Halloween, add in some modern themes and aspects, and a dash of classic Halloween references, and make a Halloween sequel deserving of the name. 
Well, I think he got a little carried away in trying to make a film that was simultaneously modern and classic, the final result is still a satisfying one that feels like it came straight from a fan of the original. My enjoyment. Halloween is a great ride from start to finish. From hearing the original theme, to seeing actors reprising their roles, to seeing Mike Myers back in all his violent glory was great. While I have mentioned a few issues that the film had here and there, while I was watching the film, I did not feel them. I was gripped right from the first frame until the last, and I had to think hard after watching it to find any flaws. I had a great time, and I can't wait to see if Universal makes another Halloween, as well as the inevitable continuations of all the other slasher icons. Recommendations If you are a fan of the original 1978 Halloween, and have been waiting for a good sequel, definitely check this film out. For those who don't know much about the Halloween franchise, however, it is still just a good horror slasher flick with some great action, solid characters, and a memorable villain. On the other hand though, if you have been a huge Halloween fan that has enjoyed all of the other sequels, you may not like the way how this film circumvents everything that came before. And also, if you're opposed to humor in your horror films or the inclusion of classic tropes and dumb decision making, you may also come out of the film a little disappointed. Nevertheless, I think Halloween 2018 is a great film and a great follow-up to the original 1978 classic. It deserves everyone's attention. Thanks for watching, I hope you liked it. If you did, leave a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe. I'm Professor Kino, and I look forward to our next discussion.